is Charles Yu. Charles is the author of three books, including the Time Magazine Best Book of the Year, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe, and most recently, Interior Chinatown. He received the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award and was nominated for two Writers Guild of America Awards for his work on the HBO series Westworld. Charlie will tell a slightly different uh, kind of parenting story. Y'all, let's welcome Charles Yu. Charlie, you are so on brand. You got the books behind you and books, ampersand books on your shirt. I'm not subtle, if, uh, in case you're wondering. Uh, I'm a writer. Um, We're not here for subtlety. Story. Go for it. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the stories, Rian, Kevin, and Jeff, and Faith. Uh, and also Aaron Cox and everyone at uh, House of Speakeasy. This is really fun and entertaining. So I'm really glad to be part of it. Um, I'm gonna tell a story tonight about um, my kids who kicked um, Santa in the balls. And uh, it's weird that Jeff told his story first. I kind of wish mine had come first because they both involve, um, no, no, my story is not about that. My story takes place um, in December, 2019. Um, and I mean, if you, if you had to pick a point in time where you could say those were the days, uh, December, 2019 probably ranks pretty high up there. Um, which at this point, it feels like it was about 20 years ago. Um, the world by my account has changed at least twice since December. Um, so all of which is to say <laughs> this piece, uh, feels pretty pretty dated. So I thought it would it would be kind of a fun thing to go back and read my own work uh, or something that I ha had thought of writing right before uh, the pandemic and annotate it a little bit with the benefit of hindsight. Um, the original title of the story was Knowing uh, because it's a story about my kids um, not knowing stuff. And, and as a story about the, the loss of their innocence. Uh, so I'm the one who's knowing, but now I've spent the past uh, eight months realizing how little I knew about anything. Um, so here we go, knowing. Uh, this story begins as all true epics do in a minivan. And uh, we're driving up uh, to a place called the Chabot Space and Science Center, which is in the Oakland Hills and the road is really winding and it's lined with these uh, redwoods, which I had to look up were third growth coast redwoods um, that are about 150 years old. And I looked that up because I felt like that was the kind of thing that a writer should know. Um, but I, I don't know stuff like that. So I just look it up and then I put it in there. Um, so we're driving up this beautiful sort of winding road and my father-in-law is driving. He's an expert driver and he's navigating the van uh, my wife is sitting next to him in the passenger seat, uh, and our two kids are in the middle. They're in these captain's chairs, so there's a gap between them, and they're sort of messing with each other across the gap. Um, and I'm all the way in the back, which is my seat in that van, and I'm, I'm eavesdropping on my kids, which is like one of my favorite things to do. Um, I just love hearing their unfiltered conversations. and. You know, the older they get, the less I get to do it. So at this point, they're about 12 and 10. And it's the week after Christmas, and we're all a little bit woozy from this head cold that had been touring our sinuses um, over the past week. And we, we get out, we park, we walk out from this concrete parking structure into, into the forest. And the air is quiet and still. And, you know, coming from Southern California where I live, where there's this kind of perpetual haze, the air in Northern California is just impossibly crisp. And it's just this beautiful setting. And it's been a while since we've been back to the Science Center, so everyone's really excited. Um, our kids at that point were in seventh grade and fifth grade. And even though, you know, seventh and fifth are pretty, are quite different, um, something collectively about our household at that point felt like we were all on the cusp of change. Um, and now <laughs> when I think about the cusp of change, uh, 
it's, it feels a little bit silly. But, but at that point, it felt like we were on the cusp of change. It felt like our kids were about to lose whatever last vestiges of little kidness and, and sort of become big kids, you know, become tweens and teens. Um, their interests were changing. Uh, slime gave way to TikTok and Minecraft gave way to Fortnite. Um, but in a larger sense, the curtain was being pulled back. They'd sort of outgrown the little theater of safety that, you know, my wife and I were trying to make for them in those first few, year, first few years when mom and dad are not only your best friends, they're your only friends, um, you know, doing sock puppets and telling stories about monsters and villagers and stories about being a good person and stories about the alphabet. And they've sort of turned their attention away from our little theater out, you know, towards the exits, towards the world where the, the real show is going to start for them. And but, they're, you know, they're not ready to go all the way out yet. They're sort of jumping back and forth flirting with the edge, ready to jump back into blankets and safety at any moment. And so at this point, my wife, Michelle, and I have an ongoing debate about Santa. Now, again, my, our kids at this point are 12 and 10. Our debate is over how many believers we have left in our house. And Michelle, I don't know why, thinks that we have at least one, our younger one, and probably one and a half. She thinks that our older one sort of believes. I definitely think the answer is zero. I thought it then, I had thought it for a while, um, but I, I sort of also was a little bit wondering if it's really so binary. Um, Cause the way I see it, we're all sort of doing this weird dance of knowing and not knowing, you know, they know, and we're pretty sure they know, but do they know, we know, they know, you know? And Santa becomes this kind of test case or like a wedge for them to open the door and peek out into the world, uh, where the world, where all the adults keep all the secrets. Um, my daughter especially is really good at spycraft at this point. She sets traps for us. You know, she watches and lies and waits and she parses all of our statements for any morsel of uninterested by us. She and her brother compare notes and they piece together the truth from our leakage. Uh, and season by season, they're sort of building a dossier on us and on Santa. And still somehow at this point, we're not all the way yet in the open. You know, the, we haven't come clean fully. Uh, the total admission, the conversation that would go something like, you know, we know that for them to just come to us and say, we know, you know, and we'll say, you know what? And they'll say, Come on, mommy, we're past that, Santa. And then we'll just have to admit it, you know, and, and we'll ask them, well, how long, how long have you known? And then they'll tell us, well, a lot longer than you think. And, and it, I think that conversation will be a relief, but also a feeling of, of loss. And, um, and I, I just have to pause here and think about the fact that this used to bum me out. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that uh, eight months ago, I actually spent time being sad about. Um, so we're, we're inside the Science Center and now we're lying under this amazing dome, this planetarium and the lights go down and the cosmos appears and we're moving near, near the speed of light. We're going to distant quasars. Um, Ecology is closed for the winter but the solar system is open for business. There are honor students there from area high schools who are demonstrating sound waves for us. Um, we touch a plasma ball, we eat some snacks, we take some pictures, and then we go to the gift shop, which is mostly the point of this trip. And my son buys this Newton's cradle, which I think people know what it is, but it's the thing where you let a metal ball go and then the momentum carries another metal ball up and He's very excited about it. And in about three hours, the Newton's cradle has become somehow infinitely tangled. It's like, you can't even believe how tangled this thing is. Um, a better souvenir was this book he got called Random Illustrated Facts by Mike Lowry, in case anyone's interested. And it's got these fun cartoons, which are paired with 
science, scientific trivia. And my son just loves reading facts aloud in this super deadpan voice uh, for the benefit of anyone listening. This is his thing. So um, he tells us that a jellyfish, a jellyfish has no brain um, and that some sharks eat until they throw up and then go back to eating. Um, and I'm, you know, listening to him recite these facts to me and I'm already sort of doing this thing I do, which is I fast forward to the day they graduate and leave us. You know, that's at, at, at this point, seven years away from my son. But, I, you know, this is me. I have a problem. Uh, I do this once a week, probably. I'm anticipating the future nostalgia that I'm feeling about the moment that I'm currently in, even while I'm still living it. Um, so that's what it's like to live with me, if you want to know. Um, it, you know, I'm imagining the day my daughter, first time in college, goes to a big lecture hall, um, has a professor who turns the world upside down, or my son, you know, winds his way through some philosophy that he reads about and happens on a new concept and it lights up his whole brain. And I'm thinking about how many more times they get to experience that. And how they're at a beginning at the beginning of their adventure um, and how I used to be the one holding this flashlight for them sweeping out the way with my you know little cone of of light and now they've entered this long tunnel of adolescence and adulthood and each year they just move farther away from me and my light gets dimmer um, and no longer as as useful and uh, another pause here to, to just reflect on the fact that given what's happened in the world this year, um, I don't feel that way anymore. Uh, I feel like my flashlight is pretty important to them and they're looking to my wife and to me to, to figure out how to make sense of a world in which, you know, everyone's it seems. So, um, so yeah, I guess that's a good and a bad thing. Um, our kids still need us. Um, earlier in the week, my father-in-law did something very uncharacteristic and he had slipped up because our, our kids are debating over who gets to eat the last chocolate marshmallow, which was a gift in the stockings that were given ostensibly by Santa. Um, and my father-in-law, grandpa, pipes up and he says, don't worry, um, he, he bought plenty more. And the kids react like they'd heard a thunderclap. I mean, this was it. This was unambiguous confirmation from a highly trusted adult uh, of what they had long suspected, which is that grown-ups are liars. Uh, and we had all been lying to them for many years. And, and so they pounced, you know. Suddenly they're like federal prosecutors. Why did you say you bought them? grandpa, uh, why would you have more? And they're just like exhilarated. They just, they've, they've cracked the case. They've done it. And my wife and I are just on the sidelines trying not to laugh because, and we can't help. I mean, what's the point? This is, it's done. It's over. We can't spackle over the facade. It's, you know, no one's being fooled anymore. And our kids smile, these kind of knowing smiles. And at that moment, all of us were sort of aware that, you know, Something had been gained, but something had been lost. Um, so we, you know, we leave the, the museum and before home, we stop for a very late lunch at this Himalayan restaurant. We sort of stuff ourselves with these delicious momos and we pile back into the minivan. And my son announces that uh, Switzerland once accidentally invaded Liechtenstein. Um, and we go home, we take down Christmas decorations and we all kind of spread out and uh, read or watch TV. And he comes to me with one last fact, which was that after emerging from their nymph phase, mayflies only have five minutes before they die, uh, which um, super bummed me out. And, um, but now I <laughs> find myself thinking about that day and moment a lot. Uh, and those really were the days. So thanks, everyone. You can hear me. I'll talk to you until they bring me up. I, that just gave me all the feels. I'm, I, I, 
I don't know how old you are, but I didn't have kids until I was in my 40s. And I feel this, uh, you've, I've never phrased, I've never heard it said the way that you say you live, which is this notion of your future nostalgia. And I feel burdened by that. Like it, it, it makes me hold every moment so profoundly. And it's, it's like, it's almost, it's almost onerous. It's well, that's Amanda, but she's, she's listening and she's got five kids. So I don't, and I, hers are older than mine, but Charlie, that story, it's just, it's so moving. And I have to ask you, like, you know, you, you said that, you know, you said as it said it as if you almost can't believe that it used to those were the things that used to make you sad right was wondering how long your child if your children know about santa and how long they've known and i was hearing you say yeah. that and i was crying like that and by the way my children are supposed to be jewish <laughs> but 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 i'm i'm not a very good shiksa wife so we've got santa and 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 my Jewish husband is the first to like make Santa's boot print in the fireplace ash, right? Um, <laughs> and and that stuff still makes me still makes me sad. Like there's nothing this pandemic has done to to um, mitigate that those kind of longings to to retain the the wonder that our children have. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm going on and on about your story. It's it's so moving, um, and. Uh, and and you're you're talking about what were you saying about the light? What were your words about the light that we hold as parents for our kids? Yeah, it's like this little flashlight, and I felt like it used to be the only thing that mattered. You know, I could show them everything they needed to see. Yeah, myself, and then they outgrow it pretty quick. I wanted to just share with you these words. I feel like it's appropriate here because they're from Virginia Woolf, and this is a literary <laughs> crowd. Um, but. Uh, you know, my, I, I, whenever I start fearing that I that my kids won't need me, I remember that I lost my mom when I was in my 20s and I, I need her as much as ever. And Virginia Woolf wrote this. She lost her mom when she was 19 and just about a light. She says, she says, um, but now and again, on more occasions than I can number in bed at night or in the street or as I come into the room, there she is, beautiful, emphatic, with her familiar phrase and her laugh, closer than any of the living are, lighting our random lives as with a burning torch, infinitely noble and delightful to her children. So the, the torch may not be the one of wonder, but it's, it's still the, the warmth and the illumination that, that I, I pray our kids will always need from us, you know?